hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. Should I describe like the colors? Yeah. Okay. They are (laughs) a mixture of bright and more muted colors. They're sort of a crazy arrangement of colors with this magenta and a teal and various colors of um, mustard and orange, but they work so beautifully together. And the first thing that stands out is a very dramatic movement of various colors. Like, um, it's like a kind of a cross between an arm wrestle and a ballet. It's a unified kind of arm wrestle. There's a vibrancy there to that choice of colors. There's warmth. Turquoise and the teal. It's like a sky blue. Mint. I don't know if it's mint green and sort of a slate blue. I don't know if that's my eyes just being liars. (laughs) A blue that I can see my kitchen is painted that color. It kind of reminds me of the 60s. I think just because the color palette has that like more retro feel. I don't know, when I see like that color teal, I just think of like a kitchen from like the 60s and 70s. (laughs) And then mixed with like a magenta and then the mustard color. I think we can kind of like think of like furniture and like appliances that were mustard colors. It's more of like the contemporary take on what that era was. The the colors are in these like geometric pieces and they look a lot like like stained glass. It reminds me a lot of flames, like flames emanating from a log in a fireplace or something like that. It could be a waterfall of colors. It could be the sunlight um, shining through different color uh, gels. I see fragments, but they're all connected by a diagonal line that runs from sort of the top right of the print to the bottom left. And so all these fragments are sort of joined together by that axis. There's a dramatic disruptive uh, line that goes through uh, the work, but um, the color is overcoming that. If anything, the color comes closer to you because of that. It's almost mirrored, like one side is kind of echoing the other, but it's kind of um, a little off, like it has that like almost symmetry. It feels to me like color that's overtaking each other, that's that's having a, a relationship or a conversation with each other in different directions. Even though you could say that it's sort of cutting all of these fragments down this horizontal line, I see it more like uniting them. The diagonal line cutting through made me think of each half is a hand and the hands are applauding when they come together along that line, something like that. It feels celebratory to me. The colors are coming together, like it's the factory floor of color. The colors are coming together trying to form something. They're looking for a shape. Yeah, it's harder to talk about when it's abstract, but this actually is recognizable because it's shapes. We all know what shapes are. Triangles and trapezoids and no circles. Every, anything with an edge. There's something natural about it, an organic, that's very kind of, um, you know, soothing and but yet inspiring. This is The Lonely Palette, the podcast that returns art history to the masses one object at a time. I'm Tamara Vishai. Episode 58, Odili Donald Odita's Cut, from 2016. I was told a lot of things would change when I had kids. People don't really hold back when it comes to that kind of unsolicited new parent advice. And the most common refrain was how differently I was going to start seeing the world. Which is, of course, true. I mean, the world is now a place where my heart exists outside my body. I can't watch movies where a child is sad or happy 
or away from his family, or pleasantly with his family. I'm kinder to parents of crying babies on planes, and I'm crueler to 20-somethings. So, yeah, I see the world differently, just like they said I would. But no one told me anything specifically about the colors. You don't really realize it when it's happening, but growing up is like one long slider just turning down the color dial. The sophisticated adult world has books without pictures and black leggings and beige Ann Taylor blazers and muted sensible wall paint with mature names like sage and linen and ash. And you get so ensconced in this world that you consider yourself enough of an adult to have a baby who inevitably becomes a toddler and then bam, now your life, like mine, is an explosion of color. We live inside a prism that reflects sunlight 24-7. Muppets, Legos, his spoon, his rainbow puffer jacket, his stacking rings, the hand-me-down Fisher-Price train that sometimes goes off randomly in the dark and bathes the wall in flashing lights like a passing cop car has been commandeered by circus clowns. And it's not just seeing color, it's talking about it incessantly, recognizing it everywhere. Every day on his way to preschool, we point out the yellow bus, the green grass, the red light. Like their color is at least as important as their function. Like color itself is a part of the fundamental substance of a thing. And the truth of having a toddler is that when you're not popping Excedrin, you really do appreciate how bright and vibrant the world is. How deeply color colors our experience of it and how exciting it must be for my son to just open his eyes in the morning. I mean, think about what color really is, how widely it casts its net in our lives. Color affects us from the inside out. It's as exhilarating and emotional as music. It's as ordinary as a plastic toothbrush handle. Color explains us. Our cultures, rituals, patterns, pigments, skin tones. And when you think about it like that, color is both exotic and exoticized, spiritual and stereotyped. And whether or not you experience color's full spectrum of light, music, movement, culture, history, and feeling, when you stand in front of this show-stopping print by Nigerian-American artist Odili Donald Odita, and you look at its abstract, unpredictable, rhythmic color shards that dance you across the canvas, you certainly feel enough of a jolt to blow your aperture wide open, to prime yourself for this incredible experience of color. And we've looked at color many times before, through artists who have attempted to articulate or manipulate all of these characteristics. The spiritual transcendence of a Mondrian, for example, or the clean visual articulation of Carmen Herrera, the emotional expressiveness of Van Gogh, the hazy meditativeness of a Mark Rothko, the historical grounding of a Kandinsky. But we've never seen them all at once, not like this. We've never had an artist so deeply mine art historical precedent to arrive at something so new, so conceptually rich, and at the same time so straightforward, really deeply rooted in culture and context. Odita is an abstract artist, but he's adamant that his work isn't abstract the way that Mondrian's is. He's not using color to achieve some sort of utopia that lifts us out of the world's inherent mess. Instead, it's like he's pulled colors from that mess, from every source in the world, every stacking ring, every puffer jacket and stop sign and textile and bit of wallpaper from a childhood split between Nigeria and Ohio. Colors, to Adita, are boots on the ground, potent signifiers, the substance of a life lived and being lived. So obviously this is a lot. 
this attempt to contain the whole chromatic world on a piece of paper, all of its emotions and experiences and associations. It would be like when Milo accidentally lost control of the color orchestra in the Phantom Tollbooth. It's all just too much to bear without the structure of an artistic movement, and yet it is far too sprawling to be contained by one. And this is what makes Odita so unique because he categorically resists movements. And this is a conscious choice. He closely studied the work of Helen Frankenthaler and Kenneth Noland when he was in art school, and he knew abstraction was his voice. But as a black artist, a historically underrepresented voice in the canon, as we dug into in episode 50 on Carrie Mae Weems, he didn't want to be swallowed by their movements, by the narratives of Frankenthaler and Noland the way that many minority voices are, like how even at our most charitable, we only understand an artist like Carmen Herrera by way of Ellsworth Kelly. We slot her in, you know, her work is like his. Like I said, this is incredibly common when it comes to minority voices, or at least minorities in the art world, like women and people of color. We put them in contexts that we can understand. And hey, I've argued for this myself in the past. I mean, better that we understand Herrera alongside the artist she most closely aligned with, to return her to where she belonged and recognize that she was there all along, than to do what art historians of past generations have always done. That is, compare her to all other women artists, like they occupy a separate space from the rest of the art-making world. But the thing is, in some ways, they do. Being overlooked or pushed out of a predominant narrative in real time affects you, and it affects your art. And Odita was particularly interested in Black artists who experienced this most, artists from a previous generation. And he made a project of interviewing several of them, hearing, in their own words, how ignored they were, how they were always seen to have come to movements late when they might have even been ahead of the curve but had just gone unnoticed. For example, black abstract artists like Ed Clark and Frank Bowling were producing shaped, colorful abstracts before Frank Stella. But because Stella was the one who made it onto the star-making critic Clement Greenberg's dance card at the time, he's the artist most closely associated with that movement and that style. Meanwhile, Clark and Bowling, like Carmen Herrera, are only just now getting their due, as though decades late to a party that they literally co-hosted. But I want to return to the question of how this exclusion affected their art. Often, it was forced into stereotypes, and sometimes by them, In his interviews, Odita also found that culture rewarded minority artists entering the fray as minority artists. In other words, leaning into what is quote-unquote expected of your work, as a childbearing woman, as an exotic person of color. Black artists from the 1960s, and particularly African artists, had to contend with the Africa that white Westerners assumed they knew. We talked about this with Ellen Atsui in episode 15, but with all due respect, no one has put it better than America's Next Top Model, Cycle 3's Yaya, when she dismissed the cheap kente cloth hat that she was nudged towards. African art, she protested, is reduced to stereotypes in the extreme, cultures flattened and mashed together under the disingenuous guise of exoticism. And so you can understand why artists both played with and traded on these expectations. Why Frank Bowling used his African blackness as both an authentic identity and an identitarian starting point when he incorporated the colors of the Guianese flag into his painting, Who's Afraid of Barney Newman, from 1968. It was an artwork that intended, more than anything, to engage the famous abstract painter Barnett Newman in a discourse on abstraction, And yet Bowling intentionally, and maybe preemptively, found his work inextricable from his identity. And so you can understand why Odita, a generation later, found all of this incredibly discouraging and wanted to be free of it. 
Broadly, of course, he shows you that if you're not really part of a movement, you can't be excluded from it. But in particular, he shows us, if you present Africa, and specifically his home country of Nigeria, in all its shades and nuances, the textiles, the wallpaper of his home, the landscape, the TV test patterns, really all of its colors, then you can evade stereotypes. And so he, as an artist, set out to create a path as unique as his own story. Born in 1966, his family fled the Nigerian Civil War and settled in Ohio, bifurcating his childhood between African traditions and American pop culture, a zigzag of experiences and associations that he reflects as shards of color in his own work. He writes, quote, I wanted people to identify the trope of Africa with this structure and color and see the patterns of one world and another world pushing into the space of the painting. People start engaging with the other things that are occurring. Texture, color, the dynamic, the composition, light, what the space creates, how it relates to your body and mind. If it's successful, he concludes, it doesn't end in a trope, end quote. So then let's try this ourselves. Let's engage with the work and everything that's occurring. I found that for me, you think you're just gonna enjoy an abstract, vibrant canvas of colors until it turns into a turbine that sucks in your eye. The painting never stops moving and your focus never sits still as the colors flash like rotating disco lights and the diagonal slash pulls you inward like you're about to go over the precipice of a waterfall. This cut, in Odita's words, allows the colors to, quote, come together and come apart, connecting yet never quite becoming one another. Instead, they transition as smoothly and completely as a DJ lining up beats and never letting the rhythm stop. This canvas is lean, pure, explosive, and resonant. Odita has taken flatness and made it dance. And all of this dynamism is entirely a product of how he chooses and aligns these colors. They're not obviously pretty together. If you describe them, especially side by side, turquoise next to hot pink, next to yellow, next to coral with that odd gash of royal blue, they would sound gaudy and discordant, a 1950s Formica hellscape. But these colors don't clash, or maybe they do, but masterfully. They're buoyant and joyful and surprisingly gentle on the eye. They're cleanly confined inside their own lines without feeling severe. Odita's use of color and color mixing is similarly a product of his philosophy, a straightforward response to a larger conceptual idea of culture and place. He describes his colors as personal, both as a visual imprint of his own travels and experiences and the fact that he mixes them all by his own hand, coordinating them alongside one another and making decisions as he goes. Consequently, he can't ever make any color twice. Like human beings, no two shades of Odita's prints are ever repeated. And in this print, in this staggering array of hues, so extraordinary side by side, he says, quote, I am commenting on how differences can be coexistent, end quote. And a print like this, one that unifies coexisting differences, is an appropriately poetic product of the Brandywine Workshop, a nonprofit cultural institution based in West Philadelphia. Brandywine's mission is to be a world-class printmaking facility for practicing artists, some famous, some unknown, some international, many local, and to donate much of this astonishing body of work to major institutions who might not necessarily acquire them otherwise, like they have here to the Harvard Art Museum. The workshop has made similar donations to 13 other major institutions in the country, institutions and audiences who now know the names of some extraordinary up-and-coming artists, artists who, like Odita, have carved their own way forward, who have refused to compromise any sense of their own nuanced identity to fit into a movement 
or a stereotype. And it's this diversity, all of these artists, says Brandywine founder Alan Edmonds, that results in real artistic quality. And so it's not surprising that Brandywine and its entire existential philosophy is a really meaningful place to Odita. Cut actually references a large mural he painted on the facade of the Brandywine workshop building in 2015, called, appropriately, Our House. This is an institution that values art as a means of tapping into one's community, boasting a mission that prioritizes high-quality art making and connections between diverse backgrounds through an exceptionally diverse medium. Because diversity is the name of the game when it comes to printmaking. There are few visual genres that invite such a multiplicity of styles and visual characteristics, not just from artist to artist, but from one batch of printing to the next. And you see this incredible variety, this throng of artistic ideas, walking through this exhibition of brandy white prints at Harvard. I mean, these artworks, a collection of screen prints and offset lithographs, they look nothing like one another. There are large, colorful, sketch-like illustrations and sensitively rendered portraits and abstract spatter and collages that look like they're tattooed onto the paper. There are images that look prototypically print-like, intentionally naive and crude, like the image was carved from the plate with a spoon. And then there's, of course, something like cut, whose clean lines and saturated color speak to where the medium can go with a painter's eye and virtuosity. But what these images share, and what Alan Edmonds had hoped to create, is an elevation of and a dexterity with printmaking, a uniquely democratic and enormously technically tricky medium. As we've discussed before, from the ukiyo-e prints in episode 42, all the way back to Andy Warhol in episode 5, printmaking is a medium that, in its very foundation, is meant to reach and unify people, as many people as possible. Because prints have the ability to be multiples. There's only one Mona Lisa, or at least only one at a time, depending on how decent you are at forgery. But there's a potentially infinite number of prints. They're the product of technology, of machinery, taking an artistic moment and multiplying it and disseminating it. And this technology also changes the work. It becomes art meant for reproduction, to quote the political philosopher Walter Benjamin. And as we discussed extensively in episode three, art meant for reproduction becomes the perfect medium for political messages, for propaganda, for the streets. We see how art meant for reproduction affects it physically. It becomes cheap, easily created, easily disposed of. Don't forget, you could have once gotten a copy of The Great Wave for the same price as a double helping of noodles. Prints were historically fragile, not because they're so valuable, but because they're valueless, created to be consumed and discarded to make room for the next one. And of course, we see what happens to subject matter that is meant for reproduction. Because they are meant to be turned around so quickly and reach so widely, they tend to focus on life as it is being lived now, life right now. We see these subjects tackled by the Brandywine exhibition at Harvard. Politics and identity, social justice and community, journaling life experience as a means of capturing the whole world at once, today, in the same glorious messiness from which Odita, the consummate printmaker, extracts his colors. This is what we are meant to see in these colors, all flashing and clashing and soulful and bright. We are meant to see the world in every shape and shard and hue of the people within it. These are people who have now been invited to participate, to bust out of movements, and to join the party in real time. Because thanks to places like the Brandywine Workshop and to sensitive trailblazers like Odita, more artists are created every day, more work is exposed to the public, and a greater spectrum of diverse, nuanced stories are told every day. Their colors never repeating, but increasing in vibrancy when they coexist side by side 
choosing to come together rather than apart. No wonder it's so exciting to open our eyes in the morning. The exhibition, Prints from the Brandywine Workshop and Archives, Creative Communities, is on view at the Harvard Art Museum until July 31st. Special thanks once again to roving correspondent Debbie Bleacher, Dr. Elizabeth Rudy, and John Connolly and Jennifer Aubin at the Harvard Art Museums. The Lonely Palette is all over social media, so you can follow us on Twitter at Lonely Palette and on Instagram at The Lonely Palette. And be sure to go to our website, thelonelypalette.com, for all the images from this episode. You can also find information on virtual museum tours that you can book for your company, peruse our store for some sweet art history swag, and support the show by becoming a patron, where you pay per episode and keep our lights on and our museum takes fresh. That's patreon.com slash lonelypalette. The Lonely Palette is a proud founding member of Hub & Spoke, a collective of idea-driven, mind-expanding podcasts. And if you're a fan of The Lonely Palette, which you clearly are since you've made it this far into the credits, then you'll love Subtitle, stories about languages and the people who speak them. In the latest episode, floods and storms in Louisiana's bayou are forcing French-speaking Native Americans and Cajuns out of their homes. Will they take their language with them? Or will climate change wipe out the Louisiana French? Listen at subtitlepod.com, hubspokeaudio.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>